Thank you so much for listening to the Money Pit Home Improvement Podcast. Before we get started, we just wanted to thank Ring, one of our podcast sponsors. Ring Alarm is protection and peace of mind. It's a powerful, affordable home security system that you can easily install yourself. I've enjoyed my Ring products. And now is the perfect time to protect your home anytime from anywhere with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash money pit for a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. You can build the system that's right for your home and have it up and running in minutes. That's ring.com slash money pit. That's ring.com slash money pit. If your roof starts to leak or your floor's really squeak, you live in a money pit. Money pit. The Money Pit is presented by Wagner Sprayers, the Angie App, LL Flooring, Craig Tool Company, and Bank of America. Now, here are Tom and Leslie. Coast to coast and floorboards to shingles, this is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. So we hope that you guys are having an awesome summer day today. We are in our part of the country, although it's sad that Labor Day is only a couple of weeks away. But heck, if you're still thinking about getting a project done now or in the very near future, we are ready to help you create your best home ever because that's what we do. We've been out this now for almost 20 years, and we are here to help you take on projects around your house that you don't know how to start. Maybe you're stuck in the middle. Maybe you need a resource or an idea. Maybe you want to vet something a contractor suggested or gave you a quote for to see if it makes sense for you. If that's you, if we're describing stuff on your to-do list, move it over to ours. Pick up the phone and call us at 1-888-MONEYPIT. You can do that 24-7, and we will call you back the next time we're in the studio. Or you can post your questions to moneypit.com. Coming up on today's show, we're going to talk about the laundry room. It might seem like a safe enough space, but anywhere that there is extreme heat and lots of water, there's the potential for trouble. So we're going to walk you through the most common spots where trouble starts and tell you how to prevent leaks, fires, and breakdowns in today's smart spending tip. And also ahead, kitchen cabinet painting is one of the most popular ways that you can get an affordable kitchen update. But can painting your kitchen cabinets provide the same level of beauty and durability of a factory applied finish? Well, they can if you get the painting steps right. We're going to walk you through what you need to know to get Instagram worthy results. And if a vacation home is out of reach, you might want to consider glamping instead. Glamping is short for glamour camping. And we're going to share some tips on how to do just that by converting your camper or trailer into a very comfortable getaway that comes home with you after every vacation. Plus, if you'd like to build projects that require a little joinery to keep those things together, we've got a great tool to give away today from Craig Tool. It's the Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro, and it's worth $99, and it's going to go out to one lucky listener drawn at random. But first, we want to know what you want to know. How can we help you create your best home ever? You can reach us by calling us at 1-888-MONEYPIT or posting your questions to moneypit.com. Let's get to it. Leslie, who's first? James in Virginia is on the line with a ceiling fan question. What's going on at your Money Pit? I live in a 1986 two-story ranch, and we do not have overhead lighting in any of the bedrooms, and there's no, there's no lighting fixtures, and we want to add ceiling fans. So I was wondering how difficult... It would be to do that in in the bedrooms. It's not terribly difficult, but it's not terribly easy either. I would say that it would be very easy for an electrician to do that because they have the tools necessary to get the wiring where it needs to go. It's kind of hard for a DIYer to do that. And the other important thing about a ceiling fan is you need to make sure you use the right type of uh, electrical um, connection in that ceiling so that you have some support on that fan because it gets very heavy and it also vibrates sometimes. So you need to have the right connection for the fan to the ceiling. And of course, the wiring has to be in place. Now, electricians can uh, fish wires through there. There's a couple of tricks of the trade that they use. They have these sort of long, skinny fiberglass rods that can be run in the space between ceiling joists to run wires where they need to be. Um, But what I would do is if you're 
thinking about maybe doing this in a couple of rooms, I would sort of pile those jobs together because there's a sort of a mobilization cost when you hire a pro for a small project like that, and maybe try to get all of your electrical work done at the same time. Now, with a 1986 house, you might also want to find out if you've got ground fault circuit interrupters protecting uh, the bathroom and the kitchen outlets. That would be another easy thing to add uh, to uh, that to-do list that will protect you from, from shocks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your help, and I love your show. Listen to it all the time. Yeah, good luck with that project and with all the work you're doing to your new house. Call us back anytime. 888-666-3974. Laura in Connecticut's on the line and wants to rearrange the kitchen. How can we help you? It's an old house. The house is 100 plus. And right underneath, right underneath the kitchen floor, there is a portion of the floor that doesn't have a beam under it. Uh, we would like okay. to put an appliance there. We would like to place an appliance there. So we just need something that would just support, support it gently, just in case too much weight. So, I mean, generally speaking, floor structures are designed to hold a refrigerator. They're not that heavy. If you wanted to beef up, the structure in that area, your kitchen already has existing floor joists, so the girder will go perpendicular to those. It's not a true girder in the sense that it wouldn't be uh, supported with its own foundation, but what sometimes many folks will do is they'll put um, a girder-like beam underneath those floor joists on some lolly columns, maybe supported by a very small foundation that might be a one foot by one foot square pour of concrete, um, so that you can kind of take the bounce out of the middle of those beams. Sometimes if you have long beams in a house or long floor joists in a house, you'll get kind of a bounce when you walk across the floor, and that can make it feel weak, even though maybe it's not, but it just has more flex in it than you're accustomed to. So putting in the additional beam perpendicular to the floor joists um, can eliminate that. It's not going to hold up more than that beam, so it doesn't need to be substantially supported. But I think still that you could do a, a carpenter could do a good clean job and and give you that additional support that's going to make you feel comfortable. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it does. Okay, now I if there is a dirt floor, would it be wise to put down a uh, cement foundation? So you wouldn't you would support it by columns, and the, and the bottom of the column would be supported by. Uh, concrete, not necessarily a complete floor, but what generally you'll do is dig out maybe a one foot by one foot square hole, fill that up with concrete and have the column sit right on top of that. Again, it's not the same kind of foundation that you would use to put a beam up that was holding up the entire house, but what you're really doing here is just sort of taking the bounce out of that floor and giving it a little bit of additional support. Laura, thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Shopping for home items should never be a chore. It should be a fun and exciting experience. At Home Goods, they have an incredible breadth of selection and styles and globally sourced goods from around the world. You can let your creativity run wild exploring the ever-changing selection of quality goods and unbelievable prices. You know, we always say that home improvement is an adventure, and that's kind of what it's like when I go to Home Goods. You know, sometimes I might just start walking around the store and sort of build out the room in my head by finding lots of pieces that work well together. Home Goods carries everything from home furniture, decor and lamps, to kitchen tools, pots and pans, and even pet items and kid toys. Yep, and Home Goods also carries pillows and throws, wall art and floral items. Home Goods is the perfect store for seasonal decor and makeovers, too. Why not change things up? Follow the seasons and the holiday with fun, creative decor. Well, fall's here, and look at October, Halloween. The holiday season, Thanksgiving, it's the time to take care of fixing up your home sweet home, and you can do just that at Home Goods. Shopping at Home Goods really is a fun and different shopping experience where you'll find unique merchandise and incredible value. Home Goods, go finding. Well, if you guys like to build projects where you're joining boards together, we have got a great product to give away. It is the Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro. It makes it easy to work with a wide variety of materials, including solid wood, plywood, and composites, as well as one by and two by boards and hardwoods. And it's great for building indoor projects like furniture or cabinets or shelves and outdoor projects like trellises and pergolas. The Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro retails for $99. bucks. you will find it at craigtool.com or nationwide at Home Depot, Lowe's, or other home centers, hardware stores, and woodworking retailers. We've got one to give away, though, to one listener drawn at random. If you'd like to make that you, call us now with your question at one eight 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 Money Pit. Steve in Pennsylvania needs some help with a building project. I love that you're planning and you've asked us to help. What's going on, Steve? Yeah, I have a small uh, summer cabin at Lake Tahoe, and the deck was built in the early 60s. 
and the step up from the deck into the cabin is a stretch. So I was wanting to put like a stoop or a, a landing or step or whatever you want to call it uh, on top of the deck that will make the step up into the cabin a little less severe. So I was looking at maybe something about 54 inches wide and 6 to 7 inches tall, but I didn't. I don't know how deep to make that uh, step. When you say deep to make the step, you mean what's the like what's the tread depth when you put your foot on it? Exactly. So what are you gonna build it out of? I was just gonna put in wood. Everything else is wood up there. So I would just use I would use a two by twelve for that step. Why not make it a nice big deep step? You could use a two by ten. I mean most steps are narrower than that, but I I, I think a two by twelve, which is eleven and a half inches, would be fine. So twelve inches deep from the edge of the cabin door to the edge of the deck. So it's just one step, basically, between the deck and the cabin door. Is that correct that you want to put in? Right. So I would make it a 2 by 12 Why not? It's about 11 and a half inches deep, and that'll be fine. Well, thank you very much for your help. You have a great day. Well, if you're a pet lover, the post a picture of your pet photo contest is presented, paw scented, you get it, by LL Flooring. And it's going on right now at moneypit.com. To enter, all you've got to do, you post a picture of your pet and you write a little short description and then share your entry and make sure you invite all your buddies to vote. And the top three vote getters are going to receive a $1,000 gift card from LL Flooring as well as a $50 gift card from Chewy. Enter today at moneypit.com slash contest. That's the post a picture of your pet photo contest at moneypit.com slash contest. Now we've got Tammy in Philadelphia on the line who's looking for a better shower. How can we help you today? Um, hi. Um, I was calling in because I wanted to find out. Um, I have an old Victorian house and I have a, a three, it's three stories. I have a bathroom on my third floor and a bathroom on the second. And when I, if someone's in a shower on the second floor and then someone takes a shower or runs the water upstairs on the third floor, the shower goes cold. And I've been asking my contractors and my plumbers, and I'm not getting a consistent answer. So I like to remedy that since I'm doing remodeling. Okay. So are you opening up walls as part of this remodeling? Yes. I'm, I'm completely stripped down to the studs. Okay, great. So first of all, the reasons you have reduced water pressure in older homes are generally because you have old steel pipes that suffer from internal rusting, and they clog. They close down, kind of like a clogged artery, and then you can't push enough water through it. And that could be your main water pipe. It could be the supply pipes that are inside the house or a combination of them. And so since you're taking the walls apart, the general rule of thumb is that whenever you expose these old steel pipes, you want to replace them with copper pipes, um, or with PEX, which is a different, a newer type of plumbing pipe. Now, the other thing is that you may not have enough water pressure coming in from the street. Well, well, the pressure, the pressure is not that big of a deal because I think that the pressure is kind of okay. It's just that, like, basically, we have two bathrooms in the house, and you can only use one at a time. Like, the water completely goes ice cold if you're in a shower and somebody comes in and uses the sink. Well, that's because the the pipes may not be supplying that hot water. They may not be moving enough hot water. What size water heater do you have? Um, 40 gallons. All right. Well, that's a minimum size, but it should be okay for, for two bathrooms. Okay. And is it an older water heater? Um, no, I just replaced the water heater. When you replaced it, did they change any of the plumbing around it? This, is it still going through the steel pipes? I don't think that they changed the, the pipes around the, no, I don't think so. So you need to talk with your plumbers about what kind of pipes you have, whether or not that's contributing to the problem. And you need to know what the water pressure is at the street, because if you're not getting enough pressure, that could be the whole cause of it. Okay. Now, I, I Googled it, and I saw something online called a um, uh, pressure balance valve. Would that remedy the issue at all? So a pressure balance valve is designed to be used primarily in a shower. And what it does is it keeps the mix between hot and cold balanced so that you don't get scorching or freezing cold waters when the pressure drops. So if somebody was to, say, run hot water downstairs and now rob all that hot water from the upstairs shower it would not change the balance of water from the mix of water between hot and cold. So the flow would be less. You'd have less of a stream, but it wouldn't be the, – the temperature wouldn't change. Okay. Right. Okay. So, no, that's not it. I don't think that's the cause. I mean, that would, that would certainly be a good thing to have and something you should consider, but I don't think that's the reason you're not getting hot water on the second floor. I just don't think you're moving enough water up there. Okay. So, basically, what I need to do is tell them to check the piping around the water heater. Yeah, and the plumber should know this, not only around the water heater, but basically, if you're going to open up those walls, what kind of pipes do you have, and are they corroded? 
and should they be replaced to help to help to help alleviate this? Okay. Um, and if all else fails, you could always add a second water heater upstairs. You could add a tankless water heater, which would be a really small unit, and it would supply additional water to that second floor bathroom. Oh, okay. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, well, I think that kind of remedies the problem. All right, well, good luck with that project. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Shopping for home items should never be a chore, it should be a fun and exciting experience. At Home Goods, they have an incredible breadth of selection and styles and globally sourced goods from around the world. You can let your creativity run wild exploring the ever-changing selection of quality goods and unbelievable prices. You know, we always say that home improvement is an adventure, and that's kind of what it's like when I go to Home Goods. You know, sometimes I might just start walking around the store and sort of build out the room in my head by finding lots of pieces that work well together. Home Goods carries everything from home furniture, decor and lamps, to kitchen tools, pots and pans, and even pet items and kid toys. Yep, and Home Goods also carries pillows and throws, wall art, and floral items. Home Goods is the perfect store for seasonal decor and makeovers, too. Why not change things up? Follow the seasons and the holiday with fun, creative decor. Well, fall's here, and look at October, Halloween. The holiday season, Thanksgiving, it's the time to take care of fixing up your home sweet home, and you can do just that at Home Goods. Shopping at Home Goods really is a fun and different shopping experience where you'll find unique merchandise and incredible value. Home Goods, go finding. Pocket hole joints are great for lots of different wood projects. Wood craftsmen and furniture makers have been using pocket hole joints for centuries. And now anyone can easily create perfect pocket hole joints thanks to the Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro. Craig Tool Company has been the leader in pocket hole joinery for over 30 years, and this is their most versatile pocket hole jig yet. That's for sure. It works with a wide variety in size of material and is great for building bookcases, cabinets, furniture, and yard and garden projects like pergolas and trellises. It's portable, but can be used on a bench top as well. Simply squeeze the large VersaGrip handle to clamp to material, set the drill bit and drill guide settings, and drill perfect pocket holes every time. Plant material in place and drive Craig pocket hole screws to complete a strong, durable joint. The Craig Pocket Hole Jig 520 Pro comes with everything you need and retails for just $99.99. It's available nationwide at Home Depot, Lowe's, and other home centers, woodworking, and hardware stores. You can learn more at craigtool.com. That's K R E G tool.com. Well, whether you're thinking of remodeling your laundry room or you just want the most trouble-free laundry room possible, there are a few things that you can do to greatly reduce chances of floods or even a fire. We're going to share how in today's smart spending tip presented by the Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards Credit Card. Well, first of all, let's start with the basics. I'm talking about your water supply hoses. Now, most washers use rubber-based water supply lines. The problem is that these hoses are going to eventually swell and then break. And when that happens, they can release an unlimited amount of water, and that can cause major damage. But the solution is simple. By just replacing those rubber water lines with braided steel water lines, they're made to withstand all of those daily stresses, and they're virtually leak-proof. Now, next, think about upgrading your water supply valves. There are a number of options here. If you've got separate water valves for hot and cold water, you could take the opportunity to upgrade to a single lever turnoff valve. Now, that makes it easy to turn both hot and cold water supplies off at the same time, and you would do that between uses, and therefore, you'd never have to worry about a leak. Now, an even better option is to install what is called an automatic shutoff valve for your water line. These valves are smart, literally. They can detect an out-of-the-ordinary water flow before it turns into a waterfall cascading through your light fixtures into the rooms below and shut that water down. Now, next, we're going to talk about your dryer. This is the most common source of laundry room fires is when your dryer vent gets clogged. In fact, lint that collects in dryer exhaust ducts are responsible for multiple deaths and nearly 15,000 dryer fires every year. But the solution is simple. It's always empty that lint trap, and then every six months you want to clean out the dryer exhaust duct. Now, there's a handy tool called the Lint Eater, and it easily does that. It's a rotating brush that you mount on a flexible rod and you attach it to your drill and then you just run it in and out of the dryer exhaust and it's going to pull out, I mean, an amazing amount of lint. It's kind of, you know, gross and impressive at the same time. Yeah, and lastly, just make sure your exhaust duct is made from metal, not plastic. If you've still got the old style dryer duct 
that's made of plastic. Replace it with a metal duct to make sure your system is as safe as possible. So just a few simple steps, and that'll keep things running smoothly and avert any laundry-related disasters. And that's today's smart spending tip presented by the Bank of America Customized Cash Rewards Credit Card. Apply for yours at bankofamerica.com slash more rewarding. Marvin, you've got the money pit. How can we help you today? Uh, here's, here's my situation. My son just recently bought in Belmont, Massachusetts, a 1913 house uh, made, uh, built in 1913. And it's got no insulation, okay? And we're trying to figure out whether it's cost-effective, number one. And the other concern was that <clears throat> I read on the Internet that if you do blown in installation uh, insulation on a old house like this, there's no vapor barrier, and the insulation would get wet and so on and so forth. Well, first of all, you know many older homes don't have vapor barriers, so that's not necessarily true. If it's in the attic and you have proper attic ventilation, then any moisture that uh, forms in the area will be vented out. There is another way to insulate this house where you don't have to worry about uh, even processing vapor, and that is to go with spray foam insulation. You know, I have an 1886 house, and I did spray foam uh, in my attic, and I'm very happy with it because it basically turned the attic into a conditioned space, so we don't have to worry about any uh, ventilation issues up there. And i got to tell you, my air conditioning bills were a lot lower after we did it, as were our heating bills. So that's a nice thing to do to an old house because there's there's so many nooks and crannies and places where you have gaps that let in ambient air and drive up energy costs. Spray foam kind of solves all of that. We used isonine spray foam insulation. It worked really well. But if you want to go with a fiberglass insulation, you can certainly do that. Um, you're going to want to use 15 to 20 inches of insulation, and you're going to want to have um, a really good solid ridge vent across the peak of that roof, as well as some soffit vents or some lower vents on the roof, so you have plenty of air that's flushing through that space, because insulation that gets damp is not as effective as insulation that's dry. And that's why we vent it. Okay. That was very helpful. Good luck. Well, kitchen cabinet painting is one of the most popular ways to affordably update a kitchen. But can painting your kitchen cabinets provide the same level of beauty and durability of a factory applied finish? They can if you get the painting steps right. And that starts with using the right type of primer. Dr. Greg Williams is an expert in all things paint. He's the director of marketing for the Bear Paint Company and joins us with tips on achieving Instagram-worthy results from your kitchen paint project. Welcome, Greg. Thank you for having me, Tom and Leslie. Good to be here. Hey, I think priming is the step that DIYers like to skip, but it's really essential for a lot of reasons, right? Yes, it's absolutely critical because, you know, it's the foundation of your coat and it gives you that strong adhesion to the substrate. Yeah, absolutely. I always say it's like that's the glue that makes the paint stick, right? I mean, if you don't get that adhesion, then everything that follows uh, is not going to be very durable. Absolutely. Yep. It could peel right off. Um, and, you know, you put in all this hard work, you want to make sure you get a lasting finish for a number of years to come. So if you're trying to convince folks that priming is key, is it one coat? Is it two coats? I mean, we all know it does the good job that you need it to, but is more better? Um, more isn't necessarily better. So with Kills 3 Primer, uh, which, you know, I would recommend, especially for kitchen cabinets, you can tackle the job with one coat. And sometimes you'll see a stain that might be still coming through, but rest assured it is locking in that stain and it's going to block it from coming through to the top coat. And that one coat is going to give you the proper foundation and adhesion you need uh, to be confident that your coating is going to last for a long time. Yeah, you mentioned adhesion. So we have products out there that are strong adhesion. You have those that are high bill. Can you kind of clarify some of those terms that consumers might see when uh, they're shopping for paint products? Absolutely, yeah. When you see adhesion, you want to look closely to what substrates it's specifically talking about. So, you know, for example, with Kills, we've got products designed for the, the right job, right? You might be trying to tackle an exterior masonry surface. You might be trying to tackle a um, kitchen cabinet project, right? And so you want to look for the combination of, of properties that's appropriate. In the case of 
of kitchen cabinets, there's moisture as well. So you want to make sure you've got something that's going to give you good adhesion and durability, but also going to be mildew resistant and moisture tolerant. In addition, when you talk about the high build, right, uh, this is delivering the, the amount of paint in one pass, right? So if you choose a paint that is a higher solids, has more volume solids with, with every coat, you're going to get a thicker film applied. And so it's important to, to factor that in when you're considering these projects, because the thicker the film, you're getting better durability. But it doesn't necessarily mean you need to put two or three coats. You can get by with one thick film that's adhering very well to the substrate to give you that good interaction between top coat as well as the substrate. Now, the top coat actually flows a lot better when you have the primer in place. We've noticed distinct differences in the way the painting finish dries when you're going over a primer versus not. So that build really assists in making sure that you have fewer brush strokes and that sort of thing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. And so one of the main features in addition to adhesion from a primer is the fact that it can seal a porous substrate or uneven sheens or uneven finishes, right? So as you go over that surface, it's going to fill in any of those imperfections. It's going to seal some of the porosity that you might have in, in different areas. Maybe you've used some of abrasive in the past and you've knocked down the gloss and it, now it's more porous. So in order to get uniform drying which will, and uniform flow, which is really important for that to minimize the brush marks, you need to probably properly seal the substrate, and that's where the primer really comes in to do that. Now, what about sanding a primer before you apply the top coat? Is this a necessary step to sort of get a better finish or not needed at all? Um, Typically, it's not needed, and the reason for that is this is designed to have a good balance of properties, and it's designed to adhere well to the substrate, but also the top coat of the primer is designed to stick very well uh, to the top coat, and right, and this is what really makes a primer different from a top coat is that it's got both the good adhesion to the substrate, but also allows the top coat to stick very well to the primer. But if you were to use these same properties in a top coat, you're not going to get your desired hardness and durability and performance. And so that's why it's it's designed in this way to really maximize adhesion between both the coating and the substrate. Greg Williams, the director of product marketing for Bear Paint Company and the Kills brand. This guy knows what he's talking about, folks. He has a degree in organic chemistry. And if you want to know how what makes paint stick, this is the guy you need to talk to. So, Craig, thank you so much for filling us in. It was really, really helpful, and we appreciate your expertise. Thank you, Tom and Leslie. Great to be here. Great to talk about Kills 3 with you today. If you'd like to learn more about Kills 3 as the go-to primer for kitchen projects, go to their website at kills.com. That's K-I-L-Z dot com. It's a good idea to plan in advance for back-to-school season, so why not plan in advance for your life insurance needs? Now is a perfect time. Yep, and Policy Genius makes that easy. You can compare quotes from over a dozen top insurers all in one place. Why compare? Well, you can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. The licensed experts at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance companies, so you can trust them to help you navigate every step of the shopping and buying process. And you could save $1,300 or more per year on life insurance by using Policy Genius to compare policies. Getting started is easy. First, head to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much life insurance coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and the scheduling for free. Policy Genius never sells your information to other companies, and Policy Genius doesn't add on extra fees. So head to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. So if you like to take on projects like maybe like cabinet work or bookcases or maybe even some projects outside like trellises and that sort of thing, you need a tool called the Pocket Hole Jig, and Craig makes the best one ever. It's the Craig pocket hole jig 520 pro we've got one to give away today to one lucky listener drawn at random and this tool makes it totally easy to work with a wide variety of materials including solid wood plywood composites as well as one by and two by boards and hardwoods and it really is helpful when you're building indoor projects like furniture cabinets or shelves or outdoor projects like a trellis or a pergola it's available 
for $99.99 at craigtool.com or nationwide at Home Depot, Lowe's, and other home centers, hardware stores, and woodworking retailers. And we've got one to give away to one listener drawn at random from those that reach us on today's show. So reach out at one eight 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 Money Pit or post your questions to moneypit.com. Kathy in Arkansas is on the line and has a question about potentially having radon in the home. Tell us what's going on and why you might think this. I, I built a house about two years ago on a slab, and I always hear a lot about radon lately for some reason. Is that a, a potential hazard on a slab home, or is that only where you have, like, uh, crawl spaces? I just I don't know how that works. So it's technically possible that you could have radon in a house that's slab on grade. Radon is a, is a, a gas that's in the soil. And if it uh, builds up to a point where it's over four picocuries per liter of air, that's the measure of radon, then you would take some action to reduce it in your house. Typically, if your house is on a basement or a crawl space, well, if your house is on a basement, it's probably at the highest risk uh, because it can come directly through the walls and get into that space and up into the house. Crawl space is not so much because it's very well ventilated. Slab on grade homes can have a radon level if the radon is very, very high in the soil. Now, the only way to know is with a radon test. Fortunately, it's pretty easy and inexpensive to do. You pick up a radon testing canister. You can buy one at a home center, or you certainly can order one online. You would place this canister in your home for a period of around two to six days. Then after that exposure period, you would seal it back up, ship it off to the lab. They would read it and tell you what your radon levels are. And based on that information, you could either do further testing or, or talk to a radon mitigator about getting it resolved. So that's the that's basically the, the long and the short of it. Um, slab on grade houses don't have as high a risk as a basement house, um, but it is technically possible for them to have elevated levels. Wow. I just wondered how I could get through the cement from the dirt. Yeah, it finds a way. Wow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Good luck with that project. Okay. Thanks so much for calling us at 888 Money Pit. Thank you. Well, if you'd like to take off for a relaxing vacation, but you need to do that on a budget, you might want to consider what some call glamping, which is pretty much the opposite of roughing it. You get to enjoy the great outdoors with all of the comforts of home, and you can take it one step further and glam up your camper to create a vacation home on wheels. Yeah, I love this trend. It's adorable, and it's cute, and it's comfy. I mean, just imagine a pop-up trailer that's been tricked out with the best bedding and the most adorable decor. You can camp near the beach or a lake, and now you've got a home on the water. And the best part is, since you can park it in your driveway after the vacation is over, you don't need to worry about flood insurance or hurricane damage. Now, this new trend of glamping is something that you can take advantage of even when you're not away. You can use your camper as a guest house, an office, a man cave, which I wouldn't think is cute or fun and stylish. But, you know, to each their own. You can have the man cave, too, in there. <laughs> I mean, really, whatever whatever you want to do, Tom, I'm okay with that. What's it called? But- a she shed or a we shed, right? <laughs> <laughs> How come it can't just be a space that we all love? <laughs> yeah, well, there are a lot of possibilities, and you can do this at a fraction of the cost of a second home. So maybe you should look for vintage camp for example, to renovate, it can be a very cost-effective project. Ashwani in Illinois is on the line with a lawn question. What's going on? I have uh, seven or eight uh, trees in my backyard, which are pretty tall, like you know, 30 to 40 feet, and they are close to my house. I have been seeing that their roots have started showing up on the ground. I don't know if it is because of the drought or what, like, you know, in a different kind of trees, uh, crab, uh, white ash, crab, apple. I'm just wondering, uh, is it something I can do to fix it? Or I have to get start getting rid of them because if they get weak and uh, they fall, then they might uh, fall on my house. Well, first of all, this is Mother Nature's way of growing these trees and the tree roots. And, and no, there's nothing you can do about it. If the trees are healthy, then, of course, the risk of them falling on your home is, is certainly reduced. Anything could happen in a storm, but... You know, I tell you, I'd rather have high trees around my house and take a, take a chance on one falling down in a storm than not because they're just so beautiful and they have so many energy-efficient benefits by keeping the sun away. Now, if they're very crowded, you may consider thinning them out. Sometimes you have to take out one tree to make room for another. It's a project I did myself about three weeks ago. Um, I had planted some trees uh, when we first moved to our house over 20 years ago, and it turned out that... Uh, One of them I felt was really sort of taking the sun away too much from another and causing it to stunt, and then it became uh, damaged by woodpeckers. So I just decided to take it out, and now that uh, tree 
that's next to it is doing much better. So sometimes you got to thin things out in order to give the remaining trees, maybe the ones that are you know in the best shape or the ones you like to, to look at the most, uh, a better chance of surviving and thriving. So I think this is really just sort of a management issue. I don't think there's anything wrong with what you've described. It doesn't give me any pause that you're going to have, you know, a lot of uh, risk of, of damage to your house. Like I said, as long as they're healthy and uh, as long as you are keeping an eye on them and making sure they stay that way, uh, and as long as they're not growing, you know, too terribly close to the house. I mean, roots that are within two or three feet of the house can cause foundation issues. But if we're talking about trees that are just in your backyard, uh, I think that you'll be okay just the way it is. Okay. And if they're that close to the house and if they're really tall and really heavy, then you may want to think about thinning them out, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Josh has written in, and now Josh says that he is in the midst of a bathroom remodel, and he's hoping to use PEX piping because he thinks it's easy to install, and also he's a bit hesitant to sweat copper joints in a crawl space due to the fire hazard. However, he found some evidence of rodents in the area, and he would like to know if using PEX is a bad idea because of their presence. Yes, rodents eat pecs. That's the one negative thing about that fantastic plumbing pipe, which stands pecs stands for cross-link polyethylene. And yeah, it's flexible, it's inexpensive, it's easy to run through walls and such. But you know what? If it's in an open crawl space like that, I feel like that's like, you know, just kind of waving red meat in front of the lions. I mean, really, because the rodents could latch onto that. And then, of course, the solution is to do treatments and to do the preventative measures to stop mice and rats if you've got them from getting into that space. But uh, I would suggest that you avoid using PEX in an open crawl space like that. Uh, I think it's okay for you to use it in the walls going up to the bathroom. But when it comes to the places that break out into an easily accessible space for one of those tiny little four-legged carnivores, I would suggest that you not use PEX in those spaces. Uh, And also, by the way, you're very right to be concerned about using a torch it's a very big fire hazard, especially for a DIYer. Another option would be to use something called a shark bite fitting. It is a non-heat actuated fitting that will connect pipes together. Or call a pro and have them do it for you. Hey, Henry just took a plumbing badge uh, over at Scout Camp, so maybe I can send my son over to help you out with that. <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> All right, Georgia writes, I have a refrigerator with an upper freezer, and recently I've been getting drops of water at the bottom of the freezer. I dry them with a towel, but hours later there's more. Do I need to replace the whole thing? Um, I wouldn't go there yet. Two things come to mind. First of all, if you've got an ice maker in that freezer, I would make sure that there's not a leak that's developed in that ice maker line. The other thing is it might just be condensation. And if that's the case, you may need to replace the refrigerator gasket. One easy way to test that is to take a dollar bill and close the refrigerator on the dollar bill and then try to pull it out. If it pulls out easily, that gasket just doesn't have any magnetic connection anymore. And you might need to just replace it, which is not a very expensive thing to do. No, no, you just have to make sure, Georgia, that you find the right one for your model of refrigerator because there are a lot of different ones out there that look the same. Well, no matter how new and efficient your washer may be, if you do a lot of laundry like we do, the temperature you select will have the highest impact on your energy consumption. Leslie explains why in today's edition of Leslie's Last Word. Leslie? Yeah, I think we all think that buying the most efficient Energy Star rated washer is going to help us use less energy when we're doing the wash. But actually, according to Energy Star, almost 90% of the energy consumed by a washing machine goes to heating the water. So using the cold wash setting as your default is going to be best for both your clothing and your energy bill. Now, in general, colors are going to stay brighter and clothes are going to last longer when you wash them in cold water. Most detergents are designed to work well with cold settings, so you only need to use the warm or hot settings when dealing with a tough or an oily stain, because that's really going to do the trick to getting those out. So even if you have an older machine, this one change can help you save energy with every load. Makes sense. This is the Money Pit Home Improvement Show. You know, this is something that's probably happened to you at least once or twice. You're standing in your shower, you're enjoying the warm water, when all of a sudden, yikes, the water turns freezing cold or scalding hot. That's an experience that can knock anyone off balance, but the solution is to install a pressure balance valve. We'll explain how on the very next edition of The Money Pit. I'm Tom Kreitler. And I'm Leslie Segretti. Remember, you can do it yourself. But you don't have to do it alone. You live in a money pit.